uh, with our first question. I guess I'll come to you for this first demo and just ask, you know, if you tell me a little bit about who uh, Macquarie Group are and, and sort of what sort of work you do. Sure, okay. Um, so yeah, by introduction, um, and thank you also for the introduction um, to myself. So uh, my name is Emma Cahill. I work in the graduate recruitment team at Macquarie. Um, so Macquarie is a financial services firm um, and we're made up of different business groups. So we've got Macquarie Capital, which is our investment banking group, Commodities and Global Markets, which traditionally is known for its, its trading, uh, risk management group, corporate operations, which also encompasses technology, um, and then I feel like I'm missing one, asset management as well. Fantastic. So I guess the other sort of next question I have really is, how did you get into your current career at Macquarie Group? I guess, Jake, if, if you'd like to start us off, and you know, what made you want to apply? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting question. I, um, so I started, I was at university graduating in, in 2009, um, and back then, Macquarie was kind of seen as the Aussie Goldman Sachs. I think it was the, the bank that everyone wanted to work for in Sydney. Um, because for you, as you study history, 2008, looking for jobs in 2009, probably not the best environment. Um, the, the role that I ended up getting was a consulting role um, at a retail bank. Um, I didn't really enjoy it. Kind of, it was slow. It wasn't really the work that I wanted to do. Um, but 12 months after that, I, I saw a role advertised for Macquarie and kind of jumped at it. Um, and yeah, kind of never looked back. Everything, everything that I hated about the, uh, the job that I had before um, was kind of not a thing at Macquarie. Excellent. And, and Emma, your, you know, what, what was your journey really through, through to Macquarie and, and sort of what you know, brought you there? Yeah, um, not a traditional route actually. So to give you a bit of context, I actually studied law at university um, and was completely set on becoming a lawyer. So once I did my degree, I then moved to London um, did my master's in law and my LPC, which is the exam you need to qualify um, as a practicing lawyer in the UK. Um, so I did that and then decided pretty soon after that, actually, that's not the career that I wanted. Um, so after a number of years of study, um, decided that I wanted to do something else, but I wasn't sure what. Um, and at the time I was studying and working full time, which for anyone who does both completely sympathize with you because it's exhausting. Um, so essentially what I wanted to do was try a job um, which was a bit more relaxed just until I figured out what I wanted to do. So I first got a admin job at a recruitment firm um, and within a few weeks was quite bored um, but I think that's just kind of my curiosity. Um, so then I got given my first client which happened to be Goldman Sachs and then within a matter of weeks um, they asked me to go and join them so that's how I first got into um, HR and then I spent a good few years at Goldman and then due to kind of restructuring at the firm I decided that I was going to look for my next role um, and I hadn't actually heard of Old Macquarie before I'd applied it was only once I'd done a LinkedIn search that I found them and then did my research um, and then it was only when I got to the interview that I knew straight away um, that that's where I wanted to be next. Fantastic. I suppose I'll come straight back to you, Emma, to just ask a little bit. I mean, clearly not at the moment, but what was your office life like? So that pre-pandemic, what, what was your day to day? sort of? Um, sure. So before the pandemic, I, I've always worked one day a week from home, um, which just so happened to be a Monday, which is quite nice after the weekend. Um, but the office itself was really busy, really buzzy, really good atmosphere. Um, I'd have kind of numerous meetings throughout the day with, with members of the business, um, hardly at my desk if I'm completely honest, um, but it was, it was a great environment um, and very collaborative. Fantastic. And Jake, you know, what, you know, what was your kind of uh, pre-pandemic work life? Um, very similar actually, yeah. So I guess no, no two days are uh, similar. Um, I guess a typical, a typical day would be something like come in fairly early for calls with with people in Sydney, wander around, visit some traders. Um, I think we're quite lucky where the office is, there's plenty of good um, food options to pop out for lunch, um, as well as coffee, which is handy. Um, back to the afternoon for a bit, a couple more emails. Um, I think we're reasonably flexible, so I like to head off to the gym in the middle, middle of the afternoon, kind of come back, um, just stay a little bit later to get through stuff. Um, yeah, it's a sort of keeping that, yeah. Keeping that sort of work-life balance, fantastic. Hmm. And so I suppose oh, I'm, I'm going to stick with you, Jake. You know, I, as I mentioned in your introduction, you're quite involved 
with um, Macquarie's LGBT network, their Pride Network. And I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about what that Pride Network is and sort of how it functions with the work it does. Sure. So I think at Macquarie, um, I guess it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a strange organisation. It's a very diverse organisation. It's very international. Um, it tends to get a very uh, diverse group of people that, that work for it. Um, I think it attracts people that naturally believe in diversity, which makes, makes my job on the, the Pride Network um, pretty easy. Um, so for everybody at Macquarie, and about four-fifths of the members of the, the Pride Network group um, don't identify as LGBT. Uh, we kind of just do fun and educational things um, to raise awareness and educate our colleagues. Um, so I guess some of the interesting things that we've done recently, we've uh, held table tennis tournaments, uh, movie nights. We had Crystal from RuPaul's Drag Race host a bingo night. Um, trivia sessions and then more serious things. So we've had um, panel discussions where we've had a, a priest and a rabbi um, just discuss LGBT issues with a with black trans woman um, and speaker series including um, the head of the, the financial regulator, um, Olympians and footballers through to cupcake morning teas. Um, I guess year round we do uh, events that are pretty beneficial like reverse mentoring. Um, we help out our colleagues in HR with um, with advice um, and then we try to help people find out about Macquarie and what a diverse place it is to work. Um, yeah so I guess the key role is kind of championing changes to policies um, and practices to make sure Macquarie is a like a market leading place to work um, and then if, yeah, if yeah. anyone ever needed more more services in the yeah, one-on-one -on -one, uh, chats. Um, I'm key, key to what we so do. would you say that necessarily would you say necessarily that sort of educational aspect, I suppose, is it's consistent throughout, regardless of whether you're doing even if even if you're bringing in outside people, even you know for the fun things, there's still that sort of that educational focus on making sure that people can you know see LGBT people, understand LGBT people, and LGBT people's you know problems and issues and and sort of uh, culture is the word to use. And so would you say that's kind of like consistent throughout then? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think what we're trying to do is is make sure that everyone is okay to bring their whole selves to work and Macquarie is a fun place to work. Um, and so we're just basically there to um, be really visible um, and to try and educate our colleagues that might not, might not have a background in um, LGBT issues, um, kind of educate so that everyone's on the same page. Excellent. And just to, I suppose to follow up then, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about, because the premise of, you know, bringing LGBT people sort of into the workplace like that. And I just wondered if you had any particular tips uh, for LGBT graduates, you know, that are about to enter the workplace uh, right now, I mean, you know, in the midst of everything that's going on, I don't know if you had any particular wisdom you wanted to impart. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think for for anyone that is getting a job where the employer is paying them for their skills, um, like the whole process, obviously having a more diverse workforce means that you can bring different opinions. And so people that have diverse backgrounds are, I guess, at a bit of an edge at the moment. Um, the, pen the current pandemic is a bit of a situation that's so unexpected. Um, I guess an employer would really value people that have lots of different opinions on how to solve problems. Um, if you had a room full of 100 people and everyone thought the same way, it'd be really boring to get one solution. But I guess now what you really want as an employer is lots of different people that have lots of different views. You might be the one that um, comes up with the best, the best solution to, to helping out some clients or the, the best response to something. Um, so yeah, I'd say, yeah, don't be daunted diverse candidates are kind of in. Definitely. And I just wonder quickly, Emma, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add at all to that. I don't know, you know if there was anything particularly that stood out to you. Um, I guess in terms of the pandemic happening at the moment, um, I'm sure that students looking to apply for graduate roles and internships coming up um, might feel a little bit intimidated just by how turbulent the markets are. Um, but I think it's important to note that a lot of companies are still hiring. Um, we are still hiring. Um, but this year, things will be a little bit different and we'll get onto that shortly. Um, but essentially, you know, it might mean that you have to apply to more places um, and you might get some more rejections, but I would just say don't be disheartened. Um, just keep going. Um, you will find something. Excellent. I suppose kind of like to, you, you've already touched on a little bit, but I suppose then, yeah, I guess my next question really is, is, you know, how do uh, Macquarie groups, how do you recruit graduates and sort of what kind of process are applicants looking at there? 
sure. So we've got quite a confined uh, recruitment process. It's a four stage um, system. So first of all, it's CV and application submission, followed by psychometric assessments, which is numerical, verbal and abstract reasoning. And then my team would essentially look at the results that you get. And if they are in line with what we're looking for, um, we would then invite you to a video interview. So the video interviews are pre-recorded. Um, so you actually, you would log on and see me because I record the questions, but you wouldn't be speaking to me. Um, and the questions on the video interview are designed by each business group. So say, for example, you applied for a role in Macquarie Capital versus Commodities and Global Markets. Um, the questions will be very different and will be designed for um, you know, that particular team that you're applying to. Um, and then, yeah, we're quite different to other banks um, and, and firms more generally in that it's actually us real people watching the videos. We don't have algorithms. We don't have some snazzy system in place, um, which kind of rules you out based on how red you're going when you speak or, you know, the, the pitch of your voice, uh, which, you know, does exist in, in other places. Um, so yeah, rest assured and be confident that it's real people watching your video. Um, and then we essentially shortlist, um, you know, the, the top candidates that's to come in to interview um, with the team at a super day. So this year, um, obviously given the circumstances of what's going on, things are going to be slightly different um, and our campaign is going to be completely virtual. So where previously you had the opportunity to come into the office for that super day um, assessment centre, um, we're going to have to translate that to a virtual setting. Um, but we've been working virtually for months now, so I wouldn't be nervous um, about that process i think we've probably close to nailed it now um so yeah i'm sure by the time it comes to assessment centers um later in the year we'll be you know perfectly set up um and be able to give you some good advice to get you through the process excellent thank you sorry about that my uh, my own internet connection is the joys <laughs> Uh, but no, excellent. So I suppose what I would really, you know, uh, I suppose as a sort of a side question to that then is that you sort of talk about these interviews. Have you any particular uh, tips or tricks or things you think that uh, applicants can do there to stand out in those interviews that will really, you know, sort of hammer home um, what a fantastic applicant they are? Sure. Um, so I'm sure for anyone that's looking to apply for a role in financial services knows how competitive it is to get in. Um, so I think before we even get to a face-to-face -face interview, which can be quite hard to, to get yourself there, some tips around the application and CV itself and then the video interview. So um, it, it's not rocket science, um, but you, you'll be surprised at how many people kind of fall down at the first hurdle with the CV. Um, so we receive thousands and thousands of CVs for our roles. Um, and literally, if there's one spelling mistake on that CV, with all the best work experience in the world, you won't be going to the next stage. Um, so would really recommend that you get a second set of eyes just to look over your application before you submit. Um, it's just such an easy mistake to make. Um, so yeah, get, get a second set of eyes on your CV. Make sure that the CV is really clearly formatted. Um, ideally, keep it to one page um, and just kind of, you know, keep it clean. Um, really only put in the things that are important. So extracurricular activities, grades. Um, a lot of people don't put their grades on and then that would imply that you don't want us to know what grades you've got. Um, so just be upfront, be transparent. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll review the CV. And then in terms of the video interview, it's really, really clear to um, differentiate between students that have really kind of done their homework and their research ahead of time. Um, and they're the ones that stand out. There's so much information on our website, on LinkedIn, um, which really kind of goes into detail about deals that we do, transactions, um, and you know, referencing the work that we're doing really makes you stand out. Whereas for example, if you tell me that you like uh, to work in a fast paced environment and that you've got good attention to detail, that doesn't actually tell me anything. Um, so if you're using these buzzwords, you need to have examples to be backing them up. Um, and similarly to show you know just how enthusiastic you are about Macquarie versus another competitor if you can talk about you know a deal that we've done or a transaction or something that you've read that's inspired you to apply again those types of details will really set you apart from the other candidates 
Excellent. And you might possibly have touched it, but just out of curiosity, what particular sort of attributes, I guess, are you looking for in that sort of ideal applicant? What, what does the model applicant look like uh, to Macquarie Group? Yeah, so this is a tough one. Um, and essentially, my answer would be a bit of an all-rounder. So it's not enough just to have the best grades. Um, you know, we assume that you're at a good university, you're applying because you're switched on, you're intelligent, um, but so, you know, so are the rest of the thousands of applicants. Um, so I would say, hmm, a bit of an all-rounder, yeah. So, you know, put your extracurriculars down, put your grades down. Those Saturday jobs also really count for something. I think sometimes a lot of students disregard, you know, those those smaller jobs that you do on a Saturday, but actually they tell us a lot about you. So for example, if you work at a supermarket or, or a shop, um, you know, we, we can see from that you're committed, you've got responsibility, you're getting up every Saturday to, you know, go to work, earn your own money. So don't disregard kind of what you think might be the small stuff because actually it tells us um, a lot about you. Excellent, perfect. And I'm going to come back to you, Jake, uh, if I may, just to ask a little bit more sort of about the LGBT network and just sort of wondered how staff are integrated into that network. You know, does the network reach out to them? Do they reach out to the network? What's, what's that, that level of integration, really? Yeah, um, so I guess whenever there's um, new starters or there's a, a big, um, we have like an annual benefits fair, um, as well as, I guess, at all of the events that we hold, the, the Pride Employee Network Group will always have a little stall where we're trying to, try and catch everyone and, and do a little elevator pitch about um, what we do and the fun, fun activities that we do and why they should join us. Um, it's usually pretty successful. Um, people will always sign up um, and start to get our, our emails. Um, they'll find out about the events that we're organizing in the future, the, the events that we're um, invited to from some of our partner organizations. Um, and then I guess it's kind of up to the staff to decide how, um, how integrated into the network they want to be. They can, they can join the steering committee and they could run events if they're particularly passionate. Um, if they're just kind of interested in finding out more about certain topics, they could just keep an eye on their emails and go to the events that interest them. Um, so yeah, it's kind of up to everyone to decide how, how integrated they want to be. Excellent. Um, and uh, I don't know, would you say that you have a lot of sort of uh, top down support with this? You know, is it, is it the case that you have a lot of sort of senior executives, senior parts that will be uh, on board with this or, or what kind of dynamic is that? Do you know? Um, I think, Kind of to the point of Macquarie being a really diverse and international organization, everything that we do is kind of from the bottom up. Um, so the, the Pride Employee Network Group started um, seven or eight years ago because a few employees felt that it was really important and they, they got it off the ground. Um, and so we, we're kind of given a fair bit of control and authority to, to um, pursue the activities that we, we are particularly interested in. Um, but having said that, we do have a lot of senior support. So I know the the CEO has spoken about um, the activities of, of Pride and what we get up to. Um, we also have some some senior um, uh, sort of champions that, that come along to our um, come along to our meetings. So we'll have committee meetings every every month where we talk about the activities and the fun things that we're planning and the, the cool events that are coming up. Um, and the head of the the local investment bank um, division um, comes along and sort of asks what he can do to help. Um, so I think it's a very bottom-up organization, but we do, we do um, quite lucky enough to get quite a lot of support from senior leaders. Excellent, fantastic. I suppose um, to draw it back a little bit away from graduate recruitment and more sort of to look explicitly at work with, you know, so Macquarie Group. So you, you started working with a company in Australia, as, sort of, as we said. Um, do you find there's a lot of option and a lot of sort of ability to sort of relocate? You know, was that a particularly easy process for you? What was, you know, what, what did that look like from, from your end, I guess? Yeah, I think uh, Macquarie's quite good at finding um, motivated people. And if, they, if there's something that they're particularly keen on doing, Macquarie's quite good at supporting them and letting them do it. Um, so I guess I ended up in, in London because the London office were really busy and they asked who was around, who wants to help out for a few months. Um, loved it, decided to, decided to stay. And um, yeah, Macquarie was, was good enough to, to find a role for me that was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I, think, I think we'd rather give people a bit of freedom and let them do what they want to do, then, then lose, lose good people, I guess. Excellent. So that, that keen attitude, I suppose, you know, pulled, mm. pulled through for you on, on sort of how many you get left. Fantastic. I don't know if I of you may know, I don't know if sort of what experience I do you have with sort of comments to other offices. Um, I just want, so a lot of questions people usually ask to the LGBT 
um, is about, you know, working in countries maybe when necessarily being LGBT isn't as acceptable or, you know, sort of maybe criminalized. And I just wondered if either of you knew kind of where Macquarie stood on, you know, its employees working in territories where that's not necessarily as accessible. I don't know um, if that's something you may have apologies to throw it. And the yeah, it's right. really yeah, unfortunately, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to. I don't want to, don't want to say the wrong thing. Oh yeah, no, 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 the feeling is that I don't know if, if that was something you knew anything about. Similarly, so I'm preempting, we always have this question. I thought I'd preempt the question before. Uh, before I yeah, to I mean, to, to add to that, I can definitely say that, um, you know, I am in the minority, I think, having not worked at another Macquarie office yet. Um, and that in terms of, you know, um, people going on secondments or transferring overseas, that it's actually encouraged. Um, and I think more people have done it than haven't. Um, but to your point about the different territories, um, yeah, I'm definitely not best placed to, uh, to answer, unfortunately. <laughs> no worries, it's perfectly all right. I suppose then uh, I'll invite our attendees now. So if you've got any questions, please either leave them in the chat, the Q&A connection. Um, but before we come to answer some of those, I would like to start, or I suppose, finish off then with one main last question from us, which is uh, whether or not you have any takeaway messages for graduates uh, that might want to enter a career similar to yours at all. Do you want to go first, Emma? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, if you if you'd like to start, I'm more than happy to. Oh, sorry, Jake. Who's going first? You or me? <laughs> oh, sorry, I was asking if you want to go first. I can go first. Oh, you sorry. Okay. Um. Sorry. So tips for a career in mine. Well, I guess it's a bit tricky because I didn't have a traditional route in um, and I literally just fell into it, which I know when you speak to students, it's quite frustrating because they want an answer of how to get there directly. Um, for me, a lot of it was networking um, and it's definitely not about, it's not all about who you know, but it, you know, if you've got people in your corner who are ready and willing to sponsor you and back you, um, it does make things a lot easier. So so uh, really invest the time in your network um, and people, you know, forming those real relationships with people that will will sponsor you ultimately. Um, so that would be my, my main piece of advice. Um, and then I think starting out, if you can just be curious um, and take every opportunity, um, you know, that you can. Um, people like enthusiasm um, and people always need an extra pair of hands. So I think if you're ready to get stuck in, um, you know, that would serve you well. Fantastic. And, and Jake, you know, your sort of takeaway message, if you will. Um, yeah, if, if people are interested in the, in the career in, in credit risk, I, I would say do it. I, I really love my job. Um, I think it's, it's quite a cool exposure because you've got um, sort of like lending people and investment bankers and traders that really wanted to do some really interesting things. And sometimes it, um, it gets escalated quite quickly because of the sizes involved. And so I'm quite lucky that I get quite cool exposure to some fairly senior decision makers. Um, but also I get to see um, the types of products that we offer and the types of clients that we're trading with. Um, I get to learn about different industries. Um, and so I think it's quite a cool way to, to learn how, how banks work, how markets work, um, and kind of end-to-end -end how we can benefit our clients. Um, so yeah, I'd say do it. Excellent. I'm now going to take some of our audience questions. Uh, I will come at you to follow up Emma's point about networking. Uh, asks, how important is it to network with employers uh, of Macquarie before yeah, Macquarie, before applying to be able to put them uh, on your application? Um, so on the application form, we do ask you for your source, um, you know, what encourage you to um, But essentially, I wouldn't put too much weight on that. Um, I think it's more valuable for the person reaching out to the employee to find out more about Macquarie and the role um, than it is to put on their application form to show, you know, that they've spoken to someone. Um, so I think it's definitely beneficial and obviously speaking to someone, you know, about their role in particular, you're not going to get that exposure, you know, from a job description or website. So I would certainly encourage you to, to reach out and do that. Um, but don't think that, you know, you have, you've got a better chance if you put someone down your application form, um, because truthfully, you don't. <laughs> I suppose to build on that a little bit, I know you talked about networking, I suppose to sort of flesh that slightly further to both of you, uh, if you had any tips on networking or how to really sort of build or grow your network like that, like what, what would you recommend? Uh, Emma, I don't know if you want to start. 
Yeah, so I think a lot of it is consistency um, and remembering details about things. For example, if you meet someone and they spoke to you, I don't know, this is completely random, about a hobby that they've got or a pet, next time you catch up with them, just asking them about, you know, the hobby or the pet will just kind of, you know, show that you've really invested, you, you remembered, attention to detail. Um, so really simple trick, um, but it seems to work every time. <laughs> Excellent. And Jake, what sort of, you know, any, any networking tips from you at all? Yeah, it's just maybe, maybe approaching it from, from the other way. I think um, one of the real benefits of networking is getting to meet lots of, lots of people from different parts of the organisation and kind of finding out what they do. It um, be quite a useful way in, in, in sort of working out what it is that you actually want to do in the future. Um, I think a lot of people have an idea, but until they get to meet people and start to experience it a little bit more, um, maybe they're not certain. So I think... Uh, yeah, try, try to meet as many people as possible. Try and try and learn as much as you can about different organizations. Um, it's quite helpful. Excellent. And a question from our Q&A that asks, should we include our GCSEs when applying to Macquarie or just our A-levels? Um, not a hard and fast rule. I would probably prefer to see GCSEs. Um, and the reason for this, and not in a patronising way, but you're, you're applying for a junior role. So there's not too much experience that we can look at. So therefore, you know, we do look at grades. We do look at internships or volunteering. Um, so the more kind of factual information we've got to go off of, um, the easier, you know, it is for us. Excellent. And I suppose to build on that a little bit, how important is that academic um, so if it's weighed against, for example, experience, is it necessary that you need to have certain sort of uh, minimum grades, minimum results across the board, or can that be compensated with, with experience? Is that more of a, a case on case basis thing? Yeah, so we don't actually um, have a minimum in terms of, you know, grade cutoff at GCSE or A level. Um, to get onto the graduate programme, you do have to be achieving a minimum 2-1. Um, but yeah, we, we take everything into consideration. So academics, extracurriculars, uh, work experience. So um, yeah, we do look at everything. We don't, you know, make the decision solely on grades. Excellent. And I suppose to build that again, I suppose a little bit more about work experience. Is there any particular work experience that's particularly valuable or that you'd be particularly keen to see? Um, or is it, you know, also how, how does that sort of factor into it? Yeah, um, it's quite broad, actually. Like some people will know from the absolute beginning exactly what industry they want to go into. And therefore, all of their work experience, for example, will be, you know, in that area. Um, and others aren't sure. So they've got internships across, you know, multiple industries. Um, and you pick up so many skills from, you know, both ways of doing it. So, again, no real kind of right or wrong answer. Um, just the variety is fine. Yeah. Excellent. We'll just see if we have any other questions uh, from our attendees and our, um, yeah, I see if we have any over on Facebook either. But in the meantime, while I wait, I just wondered what, what can our applicants, so uh, let's imagine applicants get to the application stage and they're looking at this graduate scheme. How is that kind of set up? What is the, the system for that graduate scheme and also, you know, the journey from start to finish? Yeah. Um, so our graduate program is a year long um, and throughout the year you would benefit from um, some learning and development and training. So to start off the program, um, depending on which business group you're in, um, chances are you will go to a different office location between one to, two, to three weeks, uh, which will include an induction and also some technical training and the opportunity to network with um, other graduates um, you know, globally. And then once you get back to London, we do a further induction. So, um, you know, more of a, a London slant on things. Then you'll hit the desk. And then throughout the year, there are multiple, um, you know, opportunities to have further training, um, social events as well. So we, we try and bring the graduate cohort back together as, as much as we can. Um, and yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of employee network groups, Pride being one of them, um, but also um, a group called Balance. Uh, fusion so we do encourage people to get involved in as much as they can um, and we've also got a graduate volunteer network which we call the GBN so if you're particularly interested in charitable work and um, volunteering um, you know we'd encourage you to get involved with them which is a really nice network allows you to make friends quite quickly um, and obviously you're doing fun activities for a good cause Excellent. And I, I suppose my, my sort of final uh, probe on that then, just about career progression at all. I don't know if either of you know at all much about sort of what that, that looks like. 
uh, in Macquarie Group? What kind of career progression do you look at or expect? Jake, um, I mean, let me say what I think and then you can say what you think. Um, it's, as Jake mentioned before, bottom-up approach, um, you know, very flux structure. And I think if you can prove that you're good at what you do, um, there's a lot of opportunity to develop. So it's not like there's a, a step process. I think you need, you need to prove yourself um, in what you're doing. And ultimately, we were quite lean in terms of numbers so for example if you want to join a graduate scheme where you're one of hundreds um, and essentially you know can hide behind others like Macquarie's not the place for you uh, we only take on you know the number of interns that we have graduate positions for um, and essentially you're going to have responsibility and exposure from day one but ultimately I think if you can prove yourself and you work hard um, you can get up the career ladder fairly quickly. Um, it's quite a young company and I think when I look around and think of a lot of the senior people um, in terms of age and this I hope isn't an ageist comment but they're not old um, so I think if you can do a good job you can go up the ladder quite quickly. Just I heard you sort of mention you know you only take on as many uh, graduates as you have sort of graduate positions for. So am I correct to understand that that cohort size then will vary from from year to year? Um, I mean, in the past few years, we've taken on the biggest graduate and intern classes that we've ever taken. Um, so we we are growing each year. Um, but yeah. For example, there are other banks and firms across the city that, for example, might take on 200 summer interns, knowing that there's only 60 graduate roles at the end of it. Whereas, for example, and I'm making these numbers up, so don't quote me. Um, but, you know, if we only have 60 graduate roles, uh, we'd only take 60 interns. Um, so it's not this dog eat dog, um, you know, competition between the interns over the summer to get yourselves, you know, the, the final prize, so to speak. Um, so it's a, it's a nice environment. <laughs> Excellent. And to bring us up to another question uh, from the audience here, uh, is it good enough to use the same CV for each company you apply to, or should you, uh, or should applicants tailor their CV to the values of each company they apply to? Um, one thing that I see a lot of, um, so we at Macquarie don't actually accept cover letters, um, but a lot of students take great delight in sending you their cover letters. Um, so if you're applying to Macquarie, please don't waste your time because we, we don't read them. Um, but occasionally you'll have a cover letter followed with the CV in like the same PDF file. Um, and someone has applied to everywhere else, which ultimately we expect you to. We're, we're not naive enough to think that you only applied to Macquarie. Um, but so many times we see people say, um, you know, can't wait to work at X, Y, or Z. And actually that X, Y, and Z isn't Macquarie. So, um, just make sure you're not referring to another company because it, it doesn't look great. Um, ultimately, I think you probably can tailor things to different companies. Um, and again, that would make you stand out. For example, Macquarie's got a real focus on green energy and you know sustainability, renewables. Um, so if, for example, you know, you're part of a committee um, or a society that focuses on that, you could probably emphasize that area a little bit more versus maybe another company that has got, you know, a greater focus on, I don't know, um, oil. Um, and you maybe, you know, work, do some work or blog about the oil markets. Again, they would probably appreciate that a little bit more than us. So um, I think you can probably make tweaks to benefit you. Um, but I don't think you need to have a completely different CV for each place you apply to. Excellent. Another question has come through and it's us. Uh, do you feel you could be out and proud as yourself at work uh, from the start? And do you think this has helped you in your career? I don't know, so maybe Jake, if you want to start on that one at all. Uh, yeah, I think it's def definitely possible. Um, I, think, I think maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe, maybe it wasn't really an option, but I think today, yeah, totally fine, totally encouraged. Um, from day one, um, I've always talked about my boyfriend in the office. Um, at the moment, I've got a, a rainbow flag on my desk. Uh, in my first week in the office, I emailed the, the Pride Network group and um, uh, volunteered to put my hand up and, and help out. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's definitely to totally possible. Um, maybe it's not for everyone, but that's kind of why the Pride uh, Employee Network group exists. Excellent. And, and Emma, your experience is at all? Yeah, I mean, I would encourage it, just not even just being, you know, out and proud, but, um, you know, any kind of 
diversity or for anything that you think is definitely encouraged at Macquarie. No one's kind of silenced or my experience hasn't been, you know, that you need to feel awkward about absolutely anything. It's very open culture. Um, there's a lot of support um, at Macquarie as well, especially for kind of the LGBTQ community. Um, and as Jake said, he's got the, the flag on his desk. But actually, if you walk around the office, I would say a lot of people have them just to show, you know, their support that, you know, we're allies as well. So, um, yeah, I would encourage all types of diversity and especially if you wanted to openly be out um i think that's kind of better than hiding part of yourself and coming to work and you know not feeling like you can be your whole self excellent thank you i just doesn't know if we've got any more questions unfortunately so i sort of moved to the next i've been doing right thank you very much everyone i'd like to say give another big thank you to emma and jake uh and macquarie group for coming out to uh talk to us this afternoon and i hope you will stay safe Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.